morning. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us today to learn a little bit more about New Markets Tax Credits. My name is Whitney Ferguson, uh, and I'm the program manager of the Innovate Fund. Uh, I will be kicking us off uh, here today, but before I introduce some of my fellow speakers, I um, wanted to touch on a few of our goals for today's workshop. Um, by the end of the webinar, um, I think it's our hope that everyone here has a solid understanding of what new market tax credits are, um, how the program is structured, and generally what types of projects um, can take advantage of the program. Uh, and then lastly, what are the real benefits of the program? Um, basically, why would you or maybe your client want to take advantage of this program? And I know virtual webinars are not how any of us would have preferred to be doing this today. Um, but as best as we can, we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. Um, so more like a discussion, less like a professor's presentation. Um, and I think the best way for us to do that would be for anyone that's got a question throughout the presentation, if you could type it into the question box that I think pops up on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, and any of the four of us panelists, um, once we see a question pop in, we'll interrupt whoever is speaking and, and throw that question out. So we'll certainly take questions at the end, um, but don't want anybody to feel like they have to wait until the end. You can go ahead and ask us those questions while they're fresh uh, in your mind. And Pete, if we can bounce to the next slide. So we've got four panelists with us today, uh, including myself, uh, and we try to bring in speakers from all different sides of a new markets transaction to really give you the full picture of things. And each of us will take sort of a minute or two to introduce ourselves and our organizations in just a moment um, so that you can get to know everyone's voice at the top. Um, but we have Pete Byford with Tax Advantage Group by Cherry Becker, Chris Lutzinger with Truist Community Capital, and Monica Blanton with Brightbridge Capital and River Gorge Capital. Uh, we'll also go over some project examples that have closed recently in Tennessee at the end of the presentation. Uh, and we will have Sherry Mast, who is the COO of Faith Family Medical, um, who's going to speak on her experience uh, going through one of these transactions from a borrower's perspective. Uh, and we have told Sherry to go ahead and tell you guys the good, the bad, and the ugly that comes along with a new markets transaction. So I'll go ahead and kick us off here uh, with an overview of the Innovate Fund. Um, the Innovate Fund is a certified community development entity or a CDE. Uh, and pretty shortly, you'll learn a lot more about what CDEs are and their roles in the new markets world. Um, but we have a mission of providing access to capital in the form of loans to projects and businesses uh, in a four state service area, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee. Um, and we focus that capital on projects that either create quality jobs or increase health and wellness within those four states. Uh, and to date, the Innovate Fund has secured 277 million of new market tax credit allocation. Uh, and with that allocation, we've been able to fund projects that have created over 6,000 direct jobs and serve almost 70,000 people through additional access to community services and construct or rehab about 2.4 million square feet of real estate. Yeah, Whitney, and uh, my name's Pete Byford and excited to be on the phone with you guys today. And I'm with Tax Advantage Group by Cherry Becker. Uh, we are a minority owner in the Innovate Fund, uh, but we also provide new markets tax credit consulting across all spectrums of the new markets world. Um, we, we help other CDEs apply for additional tax credit allocation. We help place and deploy allocation on behalf of CDEs, as well as projects attempting, looking for capital in the market, uh, which is my primary role as a project consultant. And then we provide compliance and asset management services that are ongoing during the seven year new market tax credit compliance period uh, for organizations within the industry. And all in, we've supported just over, or just under 14,500 direct jobs created, a little over 500,000 people receiving community goods or services, and about 7.1 million square feet of real estate in the industry.
Chris, Thanks, I'll turn Pete. it over to you. Yeah, uh, Chris Lutzinger, nice to uh, see everyone or uh, listen to everyone today. Uh, I work in Truist Community Capital. I'm based in Atlanta, and Truist Community Capital is a wholly owned subsidiary of Truist Bank. Uh, and we are making investments to improve and revitalize communities across uh, Truist Banking footprint. Um, and you'll see as, as we learn all the different roles in, in the new markets tax credit industry, we wear a number of different hats. Um, we are primarily an investor in the tax credit, to, in the tax credits themselves. So we're providing equity injections into these projects. Um, my, through my teammates and my commercial banking teammates, we provide traditional debt that can be paired with the, the injection of tax credit equity. And then we also have created our own CDE, which happens to still be called SunTrust CDE. So that's uh, not a error there. Uh, we have not, not changed the name since the merger into Truist. Uh, but as a CDE, we've won 10 awards out of 13 applications for $643 million of tax credit authority. And we've been able to leverage our expertise to close over $2 billion of new market tax credit transactions, generating new jobs and services to low income communities across the Southeast and mid Atlantic. All right, now it's my turn. I'm Monica Blanton and I'm with River Gorge Capital. So I have been with River Gorge since its entry into the new market tax credit industry, which has been about 15 years. So um, we are, we're located in Chattanooga, Tennessee, but we, um, we have a national footprint. Our loans primarily are in the Southeast and our strategy is to focus on projects that create and retain quality jobs or the projects that kind of support those projects. So as a, for instance, you might need a hospital in an area so that industrial or manufacturing company would move in there. So those are the type of projects we um, look for. And if you want to go on to the next one, um, Pete, my um, parent organization is Brightbridge Capital. Brightbridge is a 40-year-old nonprofit economic development agency. We are a CDFI and make commercial loans. We also do SBA 504 lending. So Brightbridge does the staffing for the River Gorge Capital work. And in addition to um, putting out our own allocation, we are also consultants like Pete. And our role as a consultant is we go out there and we work with projects to help you understand new market tax credits and determine if it's a fit for your project. And then we will work with you to get um, allocation committed to your project and work through closing and post-closing with you as needed. And um, we kind of got into this because we will be working with projects and then um, and we might work with you for several years before it's actually ready to fund. And at that point in time, we might not have allocation available and uh, or we're working with a project who's maybe uh, whose outcomes might not align exactly with our strategy. So in those instances, we help projects close um, with the allocation of other CBEs. So um, on to the next page, Pete. Um, now let's get into the new market tax credit um, details here. So this can kind of be confusing. There's um, lots of acronyms we'll use, but as Whitney mentioned, our goal here is really, I think the goal is to help you have a big picture understanding of new market tax credits here. And basically so that when you come across a project, you might think, hey, I wonder if new market tax credits will work for this. And um, just know that it's available and that it's a potential. And you could reach out then to any one of us. I'm sure you'll have our contact information and we would all be happy to work with you through it um, and talk to you about it and help you figure this out. Um, and one of my clients that I've worked with on a consulting basis, they dubbed me a new market tax credit Sherpa for helping them through this. And another organization that I work with on new market tax credit training, they've called me the new market tax credit whisperer. So I love to talk about this stuff. My husband's excited that I get to do this presentation today because maybe I won't be talking about it at dinner tonight. <laughs> And he, he offered me um, an idea to give you a challenge to um, pay attention and beat his five minute time span of being able to pay attention before your eyes glaze over. <laughs> so, um, so we'll dive into it here. So the 
program is actually run by the Treasury Department and through their division called the CDFI. And the goal of the program is to incent investments, private investment into low-income communities, into projects that might help address the needs of those low-income communities. On an annual basis, there's an application where organizations from the communities apply for these tax credits. And um, the it's very competitive. About a third of the organizations that apply typically are awarded the um, an allocation to it. So here, it's important to note, like the Treasury Department, they're not the ones picking the projects that are going to be awarded new market tax credits. They're picking community organizations, the CDEs, who are out there in the communities and would be more aware or more able to um, evaluate the needs of the communities and fund those projects. Right, Pete, so annually, the, um, um, Congress decides how much allocation award there is, which is about three and a half million dollars a year. So if you want to go on to the next slide, Pete, we have been, um, there's been 20 years of the program. So, so the numbers are starting to get up there on a cumulative basis. And on to the next one, Pete. So um, how does this benefit a project and how does it get to a project? Basically, what will happen is um, the new market tax credit is paired with other sources of capital into a project. Now, this slide shows that maybe um, 17 to 20% of a project is funded with this. I'm a little bit more conservative, and what I've seen lately is that um, about 15% is, is the benefit that gets to a project, and it's really 15% of the allocation amount, which is uh, nuts and bolts uh, of the project work. So it's not necessarily 15% of the project amount. But so it's paired with your other sources that you have, your equity and your debt. And um, and this, this is called the new market tax credit equity. And um, it comes in at very favorable terms, typically very low interest rate, like less than 2% right now, and has interest only payments during the seven year tax credit period. And then at the end of that seven years, frequently a lot of it is forgiven and converts to equity. So what project would not want to have terms like that? Have 10 or 15% of your project value come in and um, at very low interest rate and then converted to equity. Uh, it's hard to wrap your head around that there's something this good out there, but it is. And it's Monica, is that better than the debt that Brightbridge is putting out right now? What's that? Is that better well, than the terms on debt that Brightbridge is putting out right now? Exactly, exactly. So um, onto the next page there. So again, just kind of the steps that I just went through, um, recap that there. The CDEs apply to the Treasury Department and receive an award. So then um, when they get the award, they monetize this award. So we go out and find an investor like um, Fewest Bank here or some of the other banks that might be participating here today. They buy the tax credits. They're the ones that use the tax credits. And then the CDEs have this money that they turn around and loan to a project at these favorable terms. Then the CDEs, um, yeah, so the CDEs are the ones that picked the projects. All right, then on to the next page there. So um, CDEs, we use that term, who are they? And CDEs have a lot of, uh, come from a lot of different supporters, I guess. You have bank affiliated CDEs like um, SunTrust CDE. You have some that are affiliated with government, so it might be a statewide CDE or a regional CDE. And then you have other CDEs um, that we just are referred to as mission-based CDEs, and that would be what River Gorge is. Um, and the roles of the CDEs are to apply, get the tax credits, decide which projects to fund, and then um, make sure that uh, they maintain compliance with uh, new market tax credit regulations and do reporting to the Treasury Department. And then I think, Whitney, are you next? Yep, I'll take it from there. So here we just wanted to show you sort of the total amounts of allocation that was authorized from the Treasury Department over the last decade, um, along with about how many CDEs that allocation was awarded to, um, and just generally talk about 
the cycle that CDEs go through every year. Um, so generally the program, as Monica mentioned earlier, is authorized at a level of three and a half billion in allocation annually. Um, you'll see that $7 billion bar for the 2015-2016 round. Um, that was a double round where the CDFI fund got so behind in their schedule um, that they used the 2015 applications that CDEs submitted um, and awarded twice the amount of allocation based off of those applications um, to sort of catch themselves back up. Um, so the cycle for CDEs is that the CDFI fund will open up an application round. Um, CDEs will then have about seven weeks to submit their applications. Um, and then somewhere between six to eight months after that, the CDFI fund will announce the winners of that allocation round. Um, so the 2019 round winners were announced this past July, I think on July 15th. Um, so you can see that the 76 CDEs won in that round. Um, and I looked it up this morning, 206 CDEs had applied for that round. So just as Monica um, put it earlier, I think that percentage comes out around 36%. So generally about a third of CDEs um, have active allocation at any given time. Um, we're currently in the middle of an application season. Um, so the 2020 application round has been opened up and those applications will be due on November 16th. Um, and then we would expect the winners of that round to be announced sometime in the summer of 2021. Um, and you'll note that that 2020 green bar on the left-hand side is larger uh, than the three and a half billion that we are usually authorized for. Um, we're gonna get a little bit of a, a bump in allocation amount to help out and bring additional capital to these low-income areas that have been hit extra hard from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so we do expect more CDEs uh, than usual to have allocation around the summer of 2021. We'll bump to the next slide, Pete. So let's talk about a little about the types of projects that typically get funded through the program. Um, so there's really only a short list of end user types that are prohibited from using the program. It's things like alcohol stores, massage parlors, gambling facilities, the usual things that federal programs don't want to be funded. Um, and other than that, the program has done a really good job of figuring out how to fund most types of projects. Um, although there are some categories that you'll see on the next slide um, that get funded more often than others do. Um, so you've heard several of us mention a focus on job creation projects. Um, that's really big within the industry. We see a lot of manufacturing and industrial projects receive new market tax credit funding. Um, in the real estate and construction sector, we see a good number of grocery anchored retail projects and mixed use buildings. Um, so new markets can do sort of retail or nonprofit office space on the bottom with residential housing on top. There are some technicalities there that we won't dive too much into today. Um, another big category is community services. Uh, so hospitals and health clinics are obviously big within the industry. Um, as are nonprofit sponsored projects uh, that are expanding or bringing additional community services to these low income uh, communities. And one that a lot of folks uh, don't think about, but government facilities qualify as well. Um, so we see a good number of charter schools, both private and public um, community colleges have a lot of good projects. Um, a lot of times they'll partner with a local workforce development organization. Um, Pete, I know you closed a really cool project like that if you wanted to give a, a minute on, on the CCAP project. Yeah, so um, we've, as a good example of that, we had a workforce development facility that was going in in Martinsville, Virginia, and the local economic development authority, the county council, and the local community college all partnered, the EDA and the and the county actually jointly owned through a partnership the um, property built the a high bay manufacturing space where inbound workers to an industrial park could uh, train their workers could put their senior staff into office space while their building was being built to accelerate their profitability curve and get a specifically trained workforce in the location um, 
Cruis was actually back then SunTrust was the investor in that project as well. And um, a really nice example of using governmental funds, tax credits, private investment to bring a workforce development facility in. And it's actually already spurred. Um, the first tenant has moved into the park and they trained all of their workers at the facility. So just to give you an example of how you might undertake a government project. Thanks, and uh, Whitney, um, if, you, if, if you don't mind if I uh, jump in, and that's a great example of a project. I just want to kind of to add it some uh, context to kind of the industrial and manufacturing uh, projects and why they're such a good fit for new markets tax credits. And, and as you heard Monica and Whitney describe, you know, the goal here is to provide uh, quality jobs. So the more jobs that are created, the more attractive a project is. Um, and we're and when we define quality, we're defining quality as jobs that are paying living wages, offering benefits, offering workforce training opportunities to their employees, and really being an opportunity for a low-income person to get a job, learn a trade, uh, earn a living wage, and climb themselves up, up the ladder of economic mobility. So these jobs also need to be accessible to those low-income persons. Um, and that really is usually defined as a job that doesn't necessarily require a four-year college degree. And so when you're thinking about job creation projects that kind of check all those boxes, most of those are in the industrial and manufacturing space, because when you think about opening a factory, you are hiring a lot of people. Uh, they usually pay good wages. They offer full benefits and they're jobs that are accessible to low income people. Um, and so that's why. So there is a really nice match on the job creation side with industrial and manufacturing space. I, I don't know if any of my colleagues have anything else to add on that. No, I think those are all really good points, Chris. Um, and the, the last thing that I always note on this slide is generally when folks know a little bit about new markets, they are thinking in terms of real estate and new construction or rehab projects. But new markets is also a good fit for operating business loans. Um, so you can use them for machinery and equipment only deals if you're, you know, a an existing sort of family-owned manufacturing company and you've been thinking about adding a third production line but have never really gotten there new markets could be a really good way to sort of reduce the capital needs for that um, to get that over the line and then generally when we're thinking about new markets projects we're looking at projects that are at least five million dollars in project costs and up um, and I'm sure Chris will hit on that a little more when he walks through the structure um, of these things. Let's go to the next slide, Pete. Yep. Um, so I won't stay on this slide too much, but this is the most recent public data that we have from the CDFI fund on the types of, of projects that have received new markets funding. So on the left hand side, you've got a breakdown for all of the projects that have been closed. I believe this gets us through the the calendar year 2017 round. Um, and then on the right side, you've got just for that calendar year 2017 round. Um, obviously, single and mixed use real estate is big. Um, healthcare uh, sponsored projects um, for 2017 were the biggest types of projects. Uh, and then you've got manufacturing sitting there. And manufacturing has generally been about a third of new markets projects um, pretty consistently over the last decade. Um, but then the rest of those types of projects are all good fits for new markets. Um, they don't have to fall in with one of those sort of top one or two or three buckets. All right. So also generally when folks know a little bit about new markets, they know that projects have to be located in certain areas. Um, and that is definitely true in order for a project to qualify for the program. It's got to be located in what is called a low income community or an LIC. Um, and that's got a very specific definition. The census tract has to have at least 20% or greater poverty, or the median family income needs to be 80% or less of the area or statewide median family income. Uh, and I know there's a lot of data points on this slide. It's not meant to make you memorize this um, or, or know all of these items. Um, the easiest way to find out if you've got a project and you want to know if it qualifies is just to email one of the four of us the physical address and we can use a mapping tool uh, and get you an answer to that in just a minute or two generally. Um, and so we'll be able to tell you 
if it qualifies or not. Um, and then if it does qualify, if it also has some features that might make it a little bit more attractive to certain CDEs. Uh, and so one of those things is a qualified census tract versus what gets denoted as a high distress census tract. Um, so CDEs generally, when they win an allocation, they also obligate themselves to spend at least 75% of that allocation in higher distress census tracts. And so those distress characteristics get ratcheted up. So poverty goes from needing to be 20% or higher to 30% or higher. Median family income gets tightened down to 60% instead of 80%. We also get a pretty long list of secondary items. And if you meet any of the two of those, it can be higher distress. It's things like FEMA disaster areas, brownfields, um, local and state economic zones, um, opportunity zones count in the most recent FAQ that came out. Um, so a lot of different things, um, but again, not meaning to bog you down with all of the technicalities of the project here, but just to let you know that, you know, certain census tracts are a little bit better uh, for CDEs. And if we go to the next slide, Pete, I'll talk a little bit more about two sort of targeted geographies. Um, so CDEs get incentivized to invest in projects that are located within two targeted geographies. And what I mean by that is when we submit our applications, um, we can check a box for these two items um, and we will put a percentage in. And if we want an allocation based off of that application, we are obligated to spend certain percentages um, of that allocation in these areas. And so projects located within these areas generally will get bumped up uh, to the top of a CDE's priority list because we're always wanting to get these projects funded as soon as we can once we win an allocation. So the first one of those is non-metropolitan. And these are simply census tracts that are located in counties that are not contained within a metropolitan statistical area. Um, sometimes this answer surprises folks. Uh, you may think that a project that in your mind is definitely non-metro, it might end up not being. Um, other ones, I've seen it go the other way as well. Um, and then the second targeted geography, which is really helpful for the, the state of Tennessee, uh, is what the industry calls underserved states. So each year when the CDFI fund opens an allocation round, they will give us a list of the 10 states that have received the fewest new market tax credit allocation dollars on a per capita basis. Um, and then CDEs are incentivized to lend in those states. So Tennessee has been an underserved state, um, at least in the new markets industry for a long time. I think none of us expect it to pop out of that list for a while. Um, and so any good projects that are coming out of Tennessee um, generally have a little bit easier of a path to finding new market tax credit allocation. And this slide, just quickly, I wanted to give you a visual of the, the sort of land mass within Tennessee that does qualify for the program. So a lot of times people think, oh, it's got to be located in these low income census tracts. You know, what are the chances that my project is going to be located in one of those? Um, and it's actually the census tracts that qualify for the program make up about a quarter of the land mass of the United States. Um, and so I just pulled a quick map together to give you a visual idea of how much of the land mass in Tennessee actually qualifies. So you can look um, at the areas that you're located in or might have projects in um, and see what's going on around there. But again, just to hit on it, if you've got a project address, just email it out to any of the four of us uh, and we can get you a definitive answer on whether it's qualified or not. Yeah, Whitney, so um, you guys have done a great job of running through kind of what qualifies a project. It's got to be in the right census tract, et cetera, et cetera. But um, as Monica mentioned, New Markets is a highly competitive industry with only $3.5 billion worth of total allocation authority to spread across the entire country. It can go pretty quickly. And so when we think about a new market tax credit project, the first thing we always start with is the census tract. Is it in a qualified census tract? And is, does it meet some of those areas of higher distress that you identified, either one of the primary ones or two of those secondary ones that you were mentioning? And then what becomes really important is what is the low income community impact from the project? 
Um, and, and a good new markets project is going to be able to demonstrate significant quantifiable community impacts. So we're talking about things that we can really measure and, and compare to um, other things to determine whether it's having a great impact and medium impact or a low impact on the community. That could be quality jobs, it could be increase in some community service like medical treatment or um, mental health care or rehabilitation or lots of things, but you need to be able to identify what that specific community impact is going to be. And then we have a concept of a but-for analysis. And because this is a government subsidy program, certainly we're trying not to over-subsidize projects and, and put more equity in than is necessary to complete the project. So the concept of the but-for is we would not be able to move forward with this project, but for the availability of new markets tax credits to close the financing gap, that 15 to 20 percent gap that we talked about earlier. And you know, the simple way to think of that is, well, we got a $10 million project, we only have $8 million, we're $2 million short. And that certainly is a but-for analysis, and it's our most frequent but-for analysis. But there are lots of other things that might make a project uh, unable to move forward. We often work with real estate developers who are building a project. They can get bank financing, they can get equity investment, but getting those things, if they got as much bank debt as they needed to build the project or the bank debt came in at a certain percentage and they went to their investor partners, the returns on the project would not either support the debt load or would not support a return to the investors that would incent the investors to put equity in. So you might have a but-for analysis of we can't get enough equity at a price that makes the project move forward. Similarly, if you're working with a large corporation, um, it's hard to argue that, that Honeywell, for example, cannot find another $2 million to finish financing their new manufacturing facility in, in XYZ County, Tennessee. And so, but they can go anywhere in the world to build whatever they're gonna build there. And so the, the capital cost is often measured by those companies on a cost per widget over a period of time. And if they can go to Mexico or Canada or China or somewhere else and make those widgets at a per widget cost, including capital, that's cheaper, they might move there. And so the new markets equity would reduce that capital cost, closing the gap and allowing those jobs to remain in XYZ County, Tennessee, rather than going offshore. So lots of different ways to confront that, but you need to think through that as you're thinking about your project. And then finally, there, there's a timing issue. Um, because it's gap financing, because it's a competitive prod program and because the program normally when you think of tax-based programs you think about the calendar year right every april 15th is tax day except this year i think tax day moved but um, typically tax day is always april 15th december 31st is always the end of the calendar year if you're a corporation you've got an end of a fiscal year um, new markets is really more of an elliptical cycle the applications are out right now, probably sometime nine or 10 months from now, there'll be an announcement. And as soon as that announcement comes out, people will have money to spend. Then they'll have a really tight timeline to start spending that money. So what I'll tell my consulting projects often is, look guys, we need to be moving down a path so that on this day in the future, we're gonna have this moment in time where a CDE is gonna pick up the phone and call you and even though we've called them for nine months and told them about the program, they have said, we love it, we love it, we don't have any money. One day they're gonna pick up the phone and call and say, we told you we loved it, now we have money, can you close tomorrow? And we're gonna to need to be ready to do that um, by getting all of our other sources of funds committed, getting our approvals in place, getting our permitting done, our construction designs done, general contractor selected, and so there's a real timing balance that you need to work through to get your project ready to do a new market financing. And then for, for I think all of us on the phone, we would tell you that because it's so competitive, we need to take a good project and make it a great project. 
And some of the ways we do that is we start to layer together these various bonus point concepts that we've identified to you. So underserved states, um, <coughs> being in Tennessee is really valuable. Being in Georgia, also valuable. Um, Non-metro, so if it's in one of those non-metro census tracts and it's an underserved state, all of a sudden you've got two buckets that you might fill for a CDE. And then those favored industries. And within those favored industries, like Chris was saying about the project in, in Virginia, a, lot, a project that creates a lot of jobs rather than a project that creates 20 jobs. Not that the 20 job project can't get financed, but when you're being competitive, more jobs per million of spend can, be, can come into the factor. And then, of course, like I said, a project that can actually close financially. Um, a lot of times we'll be representing a project and Monica, like Monica will work for years and years with a project, especially our nonprofit projects that are trying to pull their capital stack together. We might get that call from a CDE that says, hey, I love that project. Are you ready to go? And we have to say, well, maybe next year. We're, we're still working. Um, so having that complete capital stack is another way to take a project from good to great. Uh, thanks, Pete. Um, really excellent stuff, and and you know it's always difficult to navigate what what elevates one project over another. I think that diagram does it really well. Um, so a little bit about the investor. Obviously, you've heard different roles, uh, uh, and really how many different roles and partnerships need to be created to kind of facilitate one of these transactions, and that's why it is a process. It's not something that can be pulled off the shelf to a project that's ready and is eligible. Um, and one of those critical roles and, and is serving as the investor, which is Truist Community Capital's primary role. And why it's so critical is obviously that is where the, the funds, the capital that are going into your project to benefit your project are coming from. They're coming from Truist Community Capital. Um, the investors are, are generally limited to regulated financial institutions. Um, and we are being uh, offered the incentive of receiving federal tax credits for making these capital injections into projects that are mission aligned with the CDEs and the programs. Um, so we write a check up front uh, for the use of your project. And in exchange, we receive a stream of tax credits over a seven year compliance period. Um, we use at Truist Community Capital, we use all of those federal tax credits ourselves. This is not a frequently syndicated tax credit as other tax credits are out there in the industry. We use all of those, these tax credits to reduce our own corporate tax liability. That's our biggest incentive, and that, in fact, is our economic return for making these investments. Um, we also do get some ancillary benefits like getting uh, Community Reinvestment Act credit, which is something fin regulated financial institutions have to monitor and deliver uh, on, on a regular basis to their regulators. Um, the, the pricing or the amount of equity investment we'd be injecting in your project is dependent on a variety of different things. Um, obviously, how much need there is in the project, uh, what, what the gap is to fill, but also there's a lot of market uh, implications or impacts. You know, uh, post-COVID banks, our investors are not projected to earn as much revenue as uh, we were uh, projected to earn pre-COVID. Um, in, in any economic cycle, there may be some period that is like that. That impacts the demand for tax credits themselves. Um, and, you know, you know, the demand for tax credits, when that goes down, the price goes down. And so the price per credit um, out there in the market will fluctuate depending on where you are in an economic cycle. Um, and it also caps the amount of investment the investors can make. Um, the main, and I, and I mentioned our return is really coming from the receipt of these federal tax credits. So we are not looking to you as the borrower or beneficiary of these, this tax credit injection to uh, provide the economic return to us. Our economic return is coming from the receipt of federal tax credits. And the risk associated with that receipt of federal tax credits is simply compliance risk. Um, and so to the extent we can successfully navigate the compliance risk, it, it can be fairly easy to manage that risk. However, the penalty for a non-compliance event is extremely high and it's called tax credit recapture. So if the project ever fell out of compliance during the compliance period, all of the federal tax credits are recaptured by 
the Treasury, um, and, and that's a pretty steep penalty to pay. Um, but obviously, compliance risk is more associated with avoiding activities that Whitney mentioned that are on the prohibited list, um, providing all the reporting and documentation necessary during, during the compliance period. Um, so these are all things, uh, obviously, all of the partners would help you navigate and as well as your consultants so that you have a firm understanding of the risks associated with this investment. Pete, if you want to flip to one more. Um, and I mentioned our, our uh, economic return is coming entirely through the receipt of federal tax credits. So when we see a project we want to support, we make that equity investment, that capital infusion into your project. Uh, and we do that on, at closing. But we receive those federal tax credits not immediately. We receive them a little bit by a little bit every year for a seven-year period. That's called the kind of the compliance period. And for whatever reason, the, uh, when the program was created, they, they, they decided this would be a 39% tax credit. It's not driven by the corporate tax rate. It's just a mandated amount in the program. Um, and so that means for every dollar of qualified equity investment, 39 cents of federal tax credits are generated. And that 39 cents is actually divvied up five cents in the first three years and six cents in each, in each of the last four years during the seven year compliance period. Obviously that plays an impact in the price per credit we're paying because there's time value money associated with our capital outlay um, during that seven year uh, uh, compliance period. And if you wanna to flip to two more slides, uh, Pete, go ahead and go to the next one first. Uh, this is a little bit about the math, and I think this really helps uh, understand kind of the numbers that we're talking about before we talk about the structure of how these deals come together. Hey, Chris, real yeah. quick. I, I think we're starting to pick up some feedback on you. I was wondering if, if anybody's not on mute, if y'all don't mind checking real quick, or, and our presenters too, we'll go on mute until you, while you're talking, see if that resolves it. Uh, still getting the same effect? Okay, sounds like that dropped. Thanks, Pete. Um, so the math here, this is, this is kind of that $10 million project example that Pete maybe already elite alluded to. Uh, you may be a, let's keep with the manufacturing facility example. You're a manufacturing company. You have a $10 million facility that you want to build. You have $10 million of eligible project costs. That means you can go out and raise up to $10 million of federal new markets tax credit allocation authority. That authority is what the CDEs own and are using to pick which projects they're gonna, they wanna see benefit from this tax credit injection. Um, so your $10 million project, you've convinced uh, River Gorge or the Innovate Fund to put $10 million of their own federal tax credit authority into the project. And as I mentioned, it's a 39% federal tax credit. So $10 million of allocation generates $3.9 million of federal tax credits. The investor, Truist Community Capital says we also want to support this project um, because it's delivering on a number of amazing impacts we want to see in our communities. And we'll say we'll, we'll write an upfront investment, a check uh, for in exchange for those tax credits. But again, we're not going to pay dollar for dollar for those tax credits because we don't receive the benefit of those tax credits immediately. We receive them over seven years. So this example is showing a, a 75 cents per credit equity equivalent uh, investment. So you take $3.9 million times 75 cents per credit. That means Truist Community Capital is making a $2.925 million capital investment in this project. And that would be the benefit to you as the project sponsor, the project owner. However, I think as uh, Monica and Whitney noted earlier, there are a lot of transaction costs associated with closing one of these deals. The biggest transaction cost being the fees that the CDEs are charging for the placement of their tax credit authority in your project. Um, they, they undergo a, a number of costs to even competitively be successful in being awarded that tax credit allocation. And this is an opportunity for them to recoup some of those costs as well as maybe develop other community or economic development initiatives that their organizations have. So, you know, maybe roughly half or a little more than half of the fees that come out at closing are going to the CDEs as their economic incentive for placing their tax credit allocation in your project. The other portion of the closing costs are legal fees, specialized accountant fees, potentially consulting fees. These are all fees that come out at closing. So 
Uh, you're not having to necessarily write a check and come out of pocket yourself, but it does ultimately reduce the net benefit of Truist's $2.9 million investment. So this example, we're estimating a million dollars in fee of fees on a $10 million project. That reduces the benefit from $2.9 million down to $1.9 million. But that $1.9 million is really that 17 to 20% net benefit that uh, Monica highlighted at the beginning and is what is why ultimately you as a project sponsor are interested in pursuing this tax credit program because on a 10 million dollar project you're receiving about 1.9 million dollars of net benefit uh, from Truist Community Capital's investment and that's actually money that you don't have to repay at the end of a seven-year compliance period um, so at, at the beginning of while well, we write this check and it comes in as low interest interest only debt to the project at the end of seven years, if Truist Community Capital has received that full seven years of federal tax credits, which is our economic return for the investment, we tell you, the borrower, you don't have to repay us for that uh, capital investment we made with you seven years ago. And that's where there's a real subsidy realized to you as a project sponsor. Uh, so I'm going to back ask Pete to back up one slide and try to kind of high level go over a diagram here that kind of outlines all the relationships we discussed in summary and some of the implications for financing your project. So we're going to stick with the same $10 million project example. Um, and, and if you look at this chart, there are two dark blue boxes on the chart. Those dark blue boxes represent some, some form of your organization as a borrower. Um, some uh, entity related to your organization. And the dark blue box at the upper left that's titled Leverage Lender, that's essentially the entity related to your organization that's kind of fundraising for this $10 million project. And that, that entity, maybe it's your parent company, maybe it's a subsidiary of some sort, that entity is raising, trying to raise $10 million for this $10 million project. And that entity can get the, the source of those funds can be a traditional bank loan uh, from potentially Truist uh, Bank. It can be equity, it can be grants, and it can be a mix of all three sources. But in this example, your, your, your fundraising entity has raised roughly $7 million of a combination of debt and equity. And obviously it's a $10 million project and there's still a gap that needs to be covered. And that's where new markets tax credits can come in. Um, so uh, obviously you've got the CDFI fund at, at kind of an ancillary position here who's already maybe awarded the tax credit authority to the CDEs. And the CDE says, I really love this project. I see the need, I love the community impacts. It's in a, in a geographic location that I serve. I will commit $10 million in new markets tax credit authority to this project. That's the green box in the middle there. Um, and again, that $10 million doesn't have necessarily economic value to you as a project sponsor or owner until it is capitalized by the tax credit equity investor, which is me. That's the upper uh, uh, light blue box called New Markets Tax Credit Equity Investor. I say, I really want to see this project happen too. I love all the impacts. Um, you know, they're a long-term client of the bank's. I will make an equity investment, and in this case, that $2.9 million in exchange for the $3.9 million of federal tax credits that's available on this project as a result of the CDE committing their tax credit authority. So I put my $2.9 million into something called an investment fund, and I combine it with your $7 million that you've raised as the fundraiser for your project. So now there's $10 million in something called the investment fund, and the investment fund invests that $10 million into the CDE, and the CDE takes that $10 million and lends it to you, but they lend it to your an entity related to you that in most cases is a special purpose entity that just owns the assets being financed by this, this, uh, this pro uh, process. So this, that dark blue box on the bottom is another entity related to you as a project sponsor that you set up that maybe owns the factory and equipment or will own the factory and equipment once the project is complete. The CDE loans the full $10 million to your special purpose entity, your, your affiliate of your project sponsor. And they do that 
to you, uh, they provide that capital to you in two notes. They're interest only, low interest notes, and, they're, and the notes are calculated with an A note that's equal to the amount of money you brought to the table as the fundraiser, that's $7 million. And the B note equals the amount of money that the tax credit equity investor provided. And it's really at the end of the seven year compliance period, you know, you're servicing that interest only debt during the seven years, uh, where we say we have the option of selling you that note for let's say $8,000. And now all of a sudden you own, uh, own a note that you paid a thousand dollars for that you don't have to repay anymore. And that's how the subsidy itself is actually facilitated. And we do that for a number of different reasons, but one of which, the, the federal government decided for whatever reason they wanted the tax credits to support what's kind of called bona fide debt to projects. And um, to meet the definition of bona fide debt, we, you do have to have the obligation to repay the financing. However, we negotiate a put call agreement with you at closing, which allows the equity investor the option of selling you that note um, in for $1,000. And and so we cannot officially say we are going to do that at closing. We can only say we have the option of doing that at a closing. Um, but in all cases, we do execute that agreement um, because we have reputational risk at, at line on the line, as well as, again, our economic return is coming from the receipt of the tax credits, not the uh, economic performance of your project. So we don't really need the, those funds back if we received the full $3.9 million of tax credits we projected to receive at the beginning of the, the uh, closing. So I know that's a lot to go over and there's obviously always questions about some of these terms on here um, and happy to do that now or, or follow up offline, but this is kind of the most probably the most technical slide in the deck and always takes a few times to go over to really grasp all the concepts. So I don't know if any of my colleagues have anything additional to add on this diagram. No, Chris, I, I think you hit it well. Um, and I would just note that it's, it's about seven minutes till the top of the hour. And I think we were scheduled for an hour. So um, I wondered if, if you guys minded if we, if we bumped through. We've got a couple project examples, but let's bump through so that um, Sherry can tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a participant at the bottom of that funnel. Um, before we before we and, and then we can go back to to a couple other examples if that works for everybody yeah i think that's um, a good idea sherry you on board with us let me see if i need to unmute you yes hello oh hey there you are good deal so um everybody again this is sherry mass chief operating officer of faith family medical center and we were privileged chris and i were to work on financing this project with them to expand their services. Um, but Sherry, why don't you tell us a little bit about what y'all do and um, and then we can talk a little bit about how the financing came together and, and what your experience was. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, I guess, to some of you. Um, we are a nonprofit healthcare clinic who has been around the Nashville area for over 20 years. And so our main goal is to take care of um, patients who fall in a gap, meaning those who have no insurance or who um, have high deductible plans, um, who are working, maybe they work for uh, part-time and they don't qualify for benefits, or um, they're working for, they own their own company. Uh, so we fill that gap. We take care of them with one office visit. We have all these community resources that takes care of them from their mental health um, to their physical health, um, as well as wellness. We have a wellness program. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I know we're um, tight on time, but I hope that answers your question there, Pete. Yeah, and so you guys were in about, Remind me again about about 9,000 square feet in in an old building that was not suited for your purposes. Um, Correct. To so for about 20 years. Okay. Yes, for about 20, we were in this tiny building. Um, I guess collectively we had about 9,000 feet, meaning in two different buildings. Um, our administration um, staff was in. Um, 
a home next door to us, meaning it had a basement. Um, there was dwelling upstairs for two tenants and then administrative space. And then we had a small office that was built back in the 70s. And so we were squished in there seeing about 3,000 patients a year. Um, and so we knew that we needed stability and room um, and access to um, a bigger building to help more people. Gotcha. And, and you guys had a very successful capital campaign that raised, remind me again, somewhere in the neighborhood of seven, seven and a half million dollars. That is correct. Yes. Yeah. And, and so, so we came to you and said, hey, we got this crazy kooky thing, financing structure with all these boxes and arrows and, and we can put new markets tax credits on it. And we're fortunate enough to find a CDE and um, Chris as investor. Um, and, and close that transaction. Why don't you talk a little bit about the the exhaustive reporting you had to do on the on the front end, and now as you're into the program, just sort of what were the things that you found the the craziest in what we were trying to get done for you? Well, when we met Pete, like Pete said, we had been in the middle of a capital campaign probably for about a year, and so we started dreaming big and realized, wow it's going to take a lot of money to build this building, um, especially in the market that we were in with lots of competition. It's very saturated with uh, nonprofits. So there's a lot of competition. And so um, that's where Pete came in. We were so happy when we got him on board. He kind of put things in perspective for us. But the ball started moving quickly once we got um, him on board. Um, we completed our pro forma. We completed um, our plans for the building. Um, we started interviewing CDEs. And then we also identified key players within our team, as well as key players that needed to help us with the process. So we interviewed um, lawyers, tax groups, um, Chris's team. And so finally, when we got all that in place, the reporting started. And it was expensive, but thankfully, Pete and Chris and everyone held our hand all along the way um, and kept us going. Um, they kept the momentum going. They gave us deadlines. Um, it wasn't easy, but it was attainable. Yeah, and you guys, um, as a as a happy ending to that story, what a month ago moved into a building that I hope looks something like this artist's rendering that we have up on the screen. <laughs> like that so in the beginning before Pete came into the picture we were planning for 10,000 square feet then a peer told us about new market tax credit and we started dreaming big so we added that second floor so we went from about 10,000 square feet to um, almost 17,000 square feet um, with room for um, two tenants so um, yeah you allowed us to uh, reach for the stars there and we're glad we did it but we, I know Chris and I enjoyed working on that project. Chris, you got any other, any other items on that one that sort of drew you yeah. guys in? Sure. Obviously, you know, uh, a, a health clinic that's providing the is quality of uh, care, as Faith Family does, is a popular asset in the New Markets Tax Credit world. Um, and I think Faith Family does have some really cool aspects to their their service. Uh, provisions and that that wellness component with the teaching kitchen and a community garden, uh, the partnership with the uh, pharmacy to provide pharmaceuticals. Your organization is going well beyond kind of what the standard uh, care that uh, medical centers provide for uninsured and underinsured folks. And it's always uh, great to see the project uh, actually complete. You know, obviously there's tons of paperwork when we're doing these deals, but to see the pictures come in and the project actually uh reach the finish line from a construction standpoint has been uh, very enjoyable excellent and and i know we're up against the hour but monica i wanted to go back and take a look at at one or two of you guys projects um you guys want to talk about jackson schools or natureplex um you know the information's up there i would uh prefer to just see if anybody might have any comments. I mean, these are great projects that are pretty self-evident with their um, 
benefits. And so, um, so I'm happy to just see if any of the participants have questions or would like us to delve into anything further. I saw there was one question about if we would share the slides, and I think we're happy to do that. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I'll ask our I'll ask our Cherry Becker tech people to figure out a way to make sure the slides get out to everybody on the on the call today. Any other questions? Whitney, you want to wrap us up? All right, well, um, we thank everybody for coming to join us today. Um, here's all our contact information. Again, we'll get the slides out to you. Um, the Innovate Fund and River Gorge Capital certainly would love to hear about your projects that might be fit their molds for, for financing. Um, Monica and I are both here as, as project consultants to help folks find their way to the finish line, which can be complicated at times. And Chris, I know you're active all over the Tennessee and Georgia and South Carolina markets for um, investor services and, and can also provide a lot of technical assistance to folks in their early stages as well. Um, so we really appreciate everybody's time and um, look forward to talking with some of you in the future. Hey, I do have one thing I'd like to add. I know we talked about um, the closing. Uh, new markets are committed when a project's ready to close. But um, but you need to get involved in the process way before them. They may not be committed until they're ready to close, but there's a lot of prep that goes into it. So really, you know, as early in the process as you start dreaming about your project, it's not too early to start um, delving into some of the new market tax credit aspects of it. And then also Pete talked about how we're always interested in hearing about projects. And again, that's not just when we have allocation, but part of the application process is we tell stories about, hey, this is what we've done, and this is the kind of stuff we'd love to do. So, um, so looking forward and projects that aren't going to be ready for six months or a year or even two years out, we're always interested in hearing about those as well. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think those are all great points, Monica, and, and we all love talking about projects when they're still at the dream stage. So uh, feel free to reach out to any of us with, with any questions at all. All right, yeah, I think that wraps us up. And um, I'll ask our, again, I'll ask our Cherry Beckert folks to help me figure out how to, how to wrap us up on a technology basis. But thanks everybody for your attention today.